Coming up, exercise could be the secret of keeping your mind sharp. New research by the University of Southern Queensland reveals 100 minutes of exercise every week improves brain health. The results, published in the journal Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience, show for the first time positive changes in cognition and brain blood vessel function in older people. It's Monday, June 13, 2022, and I'm Alan Roebuck. Welcome to Ipswich Today, which acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which it is produced and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. This podcast is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. Committing to regular exercise can boost the brain health of people most at risk of developing dementia. New research by the University of Southern Queensland has revealed. Lead researcher is Dr Edward Bliss and he joins the show now. Thanks for speaking with Ipswich Today, Dr Bliss. Thank you, Alan. Not a problem. Firstly, who is in the at-risk group and why? Okay, well, dementia is a, a very complex disease and there are a number of factors that actually lead to its development. We know that we can't change our genetics and we obviously can't change ageing. We're all going to age. And now they're, the, they're um, unmodifiable risk factors, but it's the modifiable risk factors that actually create a greater risk of developing dementia. And those are actually poor blood vessel function, physical and activity, so actually choosing not to do physical exercise and having an increased waist circumference. So basically having a bit, a bit more um, padding around the, um, the midsection. So it's not exclusively an older person's problem? It takes time to develop, and we do see that um, develop in older uh, people. There mm. are some dementia states where it does develop a, a lot younger, but they're purely um, associated with genetic um, issues. In, in this case, yes, it takes time to develop, and it is an older person problem. And basically having uh, obesity and being physically inactive and poor blood vessel function can increase that risk or it exac exacerbates the, um, the, the changes that happen as we age. So as we age, we actually have a, a decrease in cognition, which is normal, and we have a decrease in blood vessel function, specifically in the brain. So those factors, being physically inactive, obese and so forth, can actually exacerbate those changes as we age and then strongly predispose someone to, um, to developing a dementia. What led you to begin exploring the link between being obese and developing cognitive impairment? Um, well, there have been a, a few studies that have uh, looked at cognitive impairment in uh, obesity, and there were some causative studies or try studies that are trying to actually find a cause if um, obesity could lead to um, dementia. And a lot of those studies did link um, cognitive impairment and so forth to developing dementia later on. So we wanted to explore that a little bit further and actually see if there was a way we could actually decrease the risk of developing um, cognitive impairment um, down the track. So that's that's essentially the bottom line why we did it. And we also wanted to um, explore why that could actually happen. And one of the biggest things that stand out is uh, blood vessel function. People that have um, uh, obesity generally have high blood pressure and a decrease in blood vessel function. And we wanted to see if that actually occurred in the brain. And we saw that um, basically the uh, brain blood vessel function is actually lower in those who are obese. So we wanted to see if we could improve that brain blood vessel function because essentially it's it's interrelated or um, cognition is actually dependent on that brain blood vessel function. Why that is so is essentially when the brain wants to do some work, it needs some food and it needs extra oxygen. And the only way it can get that extra food or oxygen is essentially for the blood vessels to respond and um, deliver nutrient-rich blood that, that carries the food to essentially to the brain when it needs to perform work. So if those blood vessels don't respond and they don't do their job, then the brain doesn't get its food essentially to do its work then, you know, like you or I, if we've um, not eaten for a, uh, a fair while, we feel a bit, how do you say, like sluggish, I guess, is a good way to say. Yes. Um, and the brain's exactly the same. Edward Bliss, how did the research team go about selecting participants? Um, basically, we uh, ran a um, ethically approved and standard um, uh, recruitment campaign. But basically, we just had some um, criteria we wanted to meet. So we wanted to have people that were overweight or obese, and we wanted them to actually be um, 50 or older. So we're actually targeting uh, middle-aged uh, participants as well. But uh, how it turned out is that our participants were older, and they, they did fit that obese category rather than um, just overweight. 
we had an upper limit for high blood pressure. We basically we would include people if they had high blood pressure, but we didn't want it so high where it was um, uncontrolled. But um, like most of us, when we go to the doctor and we get our blood pressure taken, it's a little higher. Generally, it, it becomes under controlled under the um, the doctor's supervision. So essentially, that's that's the bottom line. We just wanted to recruit participants that um, were overweight and obese had some minor complications possibly like high blood pressure um, and we also wanted to exclude those uh, in the study that had developed a, a dementia just so we had a level playing field. Over what period of time did you conduct the research? Um, so the actual intervention itself was 16 weeks. So the participants in the uh, exercise arm actually performed four months of um, exercise. So uh, yeah, 16 weeks. Talking about the physical aspects of that research, were you able to measure any changes in the brain and, and were they significant? Uh, we did. Uh, actually, our study, um, what generally happens with these studies, they, they tend to only just focus on cognition. Um, and we went one step further and we focused on brain blood vessel function, as I mentioned before as well. Some studies have actually just measured brain blood vessel function solely. Not many studies, if any, have actually looked at exercise and looked at um, both cognition and brain blood vessel function at the same time. So our study was actually the first to show that both cognition and brain blood vessel response to a physical stimulus and also to um, cognitive tasks um, actually increase. And those uh, increases were actually significant. So essentially, uh, the brain blood vessels response to a physical stimulus was actually 35% higher in those that performed exercise training over the four months compared to those who did not. And the overall response to cognitive tasks and also their total cognitive function was 10% higher following exercise, which was significant. And when we're saying we're comparing both the, um, the those that are exercise and those that didn't, we compared their results right at the start of the study and there was no significant difference between those two. So it was the exercise that actually improved the brain blood vessel function and also cognition. I think as we get older, exercise doesn't come as naturally or as easy. So what kind of exercise are you suggesting should be done? Okay, yeah, I, I understand uh, there's a lot of different barriers to actually doing exercise. Um, my, my message is actually just quite simple, just get moving if you can. It doesn't have to be groundbreaking exercise. We don't need to go and buy the, the latest rower from um, whoever it might be. Mm. We just need to get moving. So if you're not doing anything at present, maybe a walk where you're just getting that little bit breathless and so forth is a fantastic start. Um, but one of the things that we need to try and do is actually ensure that we're being challenged. So we want to mix the intensity up a little bit. So our study did moderate and vigorous or high intensity exercise as well. So that really challenged our participants. And that might be the key to actually um, performing less exercise in the physical activity guidelines. But what we did as well with some of our exercises is we broke them up into small circuits or uh, blocks to ensure that the exercises didn't become you know, mundane or anything like that. We had functional exercises like, um, you know, sit the stands, that, that's nothing groundbreaking, you just need a chair, marching on the spot while pressing up in the air, step ups and so forth, anything just to get the heart rate um, ticking. And we also did some fun things um, that involved a ball and a group. So, um, you know, some mornings for a warm up, for example, we'd walk um, briskly across a, um, a field just passing a football between each other. Um, and on top of that as well, you you know, someone drops it and you, know, you have a bit of a chuckle at who drops it and so forth. It just creates a bit of um, interaction and socialisation as well. And I think that's pretty important when we exercise, if we, if we can create that sort of environment. I might have to start with a good old-fashioned walk around the block. <laughs> yeah, anything's better than nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, where to from here? Is there a follow-up to this body of research? Uh, what have you got planned? Yeah, there is. So basically, um, we've, we've also done a, a, another study where we're comparing those that are physically um, active, um, you know, and have been lifelong physically active compared to those that are, are not physically active. So we, we've completed that study and that's um, undergoing the review process now. But something else we're going to do too, because not everyone may want to exercise, there's barriers to exercise. So we wanted to actually start thinking about, okay, well, how else could we possibly improve um, brain blood vessel function and those, those factors that can actually lead to decreased brain function. So that obesity, poor blood vessel function and um, also inflammation. And one of those um, things that I've actually looked at in the previous study was um, capsaicin. Capsaicin is the um, spicy component of chili. 
And of course, if we were just to have that, we, we probably wouldn't have it very uh, much at all because it's quite pungent. So I actually use this in an animal study in metabolic syndrome rats. So that's where they have poor blood vessel function, they're obese, they've got poor um, blood sugar levels and they've got um, increased blood lipids as well or, or fat in the blood. And we saw a, a reversal using capsaicin. So we wanted to actually take this to the next step and, and look at it in a um, clinical study. So start looking at it in humans. And what we're doing here, we're actually using something called Capsimax, where there's a formulation um, of, of capsaicin that doesn't burn. Okay, so you can actually keep um, in, in ingesting that uh, comfortably for a prolonged period. So that's going to be our follow-up study as well. So we're going to look at the effect of Capsimax on brain blood vessel function. The other thing we're trying to do is also understand the mechanisms a little bit more deeply that um, involve improvements in brain blood vessel function and cognition. So that's going to do a uh, that's going to take a bit of um, um, investigation within the actual classic scientific laboratory, uh, or what we like to call the wet lab. The final thing as well, we we don't think that these changes are limited to just obesity. Chronic conditions seem to um, predispose people to developing a cognitive impairment. So we're actually um, looking at um, starting a study in the next month or so in, in breast cancer survivors as well, because there's reports of um, cognitive impairment and so forth there. So we're also looking at um, applying this, this research to other chronic diseases. A very important body of research you've, you've done and uh, more on the way. Dr. Edward Bliss from the University of Southern Queensland, thank you so much for speaking with Ipswich today. Not a problem. Thank you very much, Alan. You'll find a handy link in the show notes to the article published in Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience. Ipswich Today is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. This podcast is also listener-supported please make a once-only gift or regular donation to help keep it online. Just go to ipswichtoday.com.au and click the Donate button on the homepage to make a payment through PayPal. Follow and stream this podcast from your favourite app, including iHeartRadio and Amazon Music Podcasts, or play Ipswich Today from Smart Speakers. Music is supplied by Purple Planet Music. This is Alan Roebuck. Thank you for listening.